Hello and welcome to ICNA Relief's webinar on uh, resettlement in America, the refugee journey. It is such a pleasure to have you here this afternoon and we really hope to have some wonderful speakers who will really provide us with a lot of important timely information. My name is Sister Malika McDonald and myself and Sister Hala will be your host this evening. Welcome Hala. Hey, hi Malika, as everybody. This is Hala Halabi, I'm the Director for the Refugee Services at New Relief. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Okay, so Alhamdulillah, we are representing ICNA Relief USA. And just a little information about ICNA Relief before we move on into our program. Um, ICNA Relief is presently active in 35 states. We have field offices in 35 states, mashallah, serving over 654 cities. So we are spreading across the country, alhamdulillah. Um, through those uh, states, we also have 50 food pantries, which many of you who know ICNA Relief have seen us active on the ground, especially during COVID-19, serving thousands of people. Alhamdulillah, we are one of the only um, organizations that has a halal food pantry across the country. In addition, we have eight free health centers. You might know us by our Shifa clinics. We have eight health centers now in the U.S. with um, four mobile vans in partnership with the Association of Pakistani Physicians, APNA. So we really thank them for supporting us and sponsoring our mobile clinics, which are very active when we go into places where have been hit by a disaster, hurricanes or tornadoes. We're able to take those health clinic vans into those communities and really serve those that were impacted by disaster. And speaking of disasters, mashallah, since Hurricane Katrina, ICNA Relief has responded to 70, 72 natural disasters. Can you imagine, you know, ICNA Relief, a Muslim organization, going into these communities to serve? It's such a representation of truly living Islam and showing others through our actions. So mashallah, um, I know we were just down in Louisiana and Texas serving during Hurricane Ida. There were so many impacted um, all up the East Coast, basically. So alhamdulillah, ICNA Relief was there to be able to serve and help people rebuild their lives. Another program of ICNA Relief, which is also centered around building lives or rebuilding lives, is our transitional housing program for homeless women and children. We have 24 homes across the country. Mashallah, we've served over 2,500 women and children since we opened in 2008. Um, I had the pleasure of opening our first home in Jamaica, New York, where our headquarters is. So alhamdulillah, we've truly expanded from 2008 to today. Two, uh, 24 homes. Can you imagine? My goal is that we will be in every major city there where there is a need, inshallah. So, Sister Hala, um, are you ready to begin our program? I know many people are very interested in learning about the refugee resettlement process, the crisis that we're seeing now, and yeah. what we can do to help. Yes, yes, inshallah. Uh, first, thank you so much, Sister Malika, for this amazing introduction and these numbers. This is just like amazing, mashallah. And yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people asking and wondering about the situation and what's going on, how people can help, what is the situation with the refugees. So that's why we have our amazing speakers here with us today to tell us about the, uh, the situation, what's going on, how people can help. And our first speaker, Brother uh, Harris, uh, Harris Karan, he's uh, coming from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. He's the senior advisor operation. Uh, Brother Harris, if you can uh, please tell us what, uh, what's the situation with the refugees right now. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Brother Harris. Wonderful. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, can we bring Harris Brother to... Harris online, please? Can we see, bring his camera on, inshallah? Uh, I am not in the space to turn my camera on but i can okay no problem mm -hmm. so my, my my apologies <laughs> so uh, please continue you can start with uh, your uh, yeah like introduction about your work what you're uh, what you're doing sure my name is Harish Tareen. i am a uh, senior policy advisor at the office for civil rights and civil liberties um on usually uh on a regular basis uh, but I was asked by uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, to be a senior advisor to Operation Allies Welcome. Uh, as you know, Operation Allies Welcome uh, is essentially the 
um, a home for the uh, current refugee influx, uh, the influx of our Afghan guests and allies who are coming from Afghanistan uh, after the crisis uh, in Afghanistan. Um, uh, so we have uh, committed to bringing uh, those who, who stood with us uh, as Americans, uh, our friends, uh, our allies, our partners, um, and there uh, currently we have about 63,000 um, uh, Afghan um, friends and, and guests who are here in the United States. Uh, we have probably another 14 to uh, 15,000 who will also be arriving soon. So that, that brings the number to close to about um, 80,000 people who will be arriving in the next uh, in the next few weeks, and then who will be resettled in the United States as their new home. Um, we have, uh, uh, our goal was to essentially bring our Afghan uh, guests here to the U.S., have them process, uh, immigration processing done, um, uh, medical checks done, and then at, uh, quite literally after that, to have them resettled in the various cities in this in, around the country, as you know, many of the resettlement agencies uh, who do this type of work, we were hoping to get them quickly resettled. Unfortunately, um, as you might have heard, and out of an abundant, abundance of caution, we had some measles outbreaks. Um, and so we had a few measles cases. And so according to CDC guidelines and public health uh, guidelines, we had to keep our guests on uh, the eight, uh, what we call safe havens. Uh, these are military bases around the country, three in Virginia, uh, one in Wisconsin, one in Indiana, one in Texas, one in New Jersey, and one in New Mexico. We had to keep our uh, guests on the safe haven until we were able to fully vaccinate all 63,000 people um, and then also give them tuberculosis screening and, and medical checks and tests so that once they go out for resettlement around the countries, their health uh, would be considered and also the health of our communities. So as you can imagine, this has been a quite a bit of an un undertaking. In the US, we really don't have the capacity to do all of this at once. Um, on, on an annual basis, we bring about, we bring less than 100,000 refugees. Uh, and in the past four years, that number has gone down to, to almost 7,000. 7, and so the infrastructure to resettle a lot of our friends and our allies were really just not there uh, to, uh, to, to make this happen. So it is taking time and with, a, with strong public and private partnerships, group like, groups like Ikna Relief, uh, IRC, the Red Cross, uh, uh, Masajid around the country, churches, synagogues. I mean, Americans really have been um, have been generous and stepped up. And so in partnership with the private sector, uh, we have we are essentially right now hosting 63,000 people on these safe havens and uh, feeding them on a daily basis, making sure they're comfortable, making sure that they have, you know, faith based essentials that are met and cultural essentials that are met, um, you know, providing everyone halal food, providing everyone um, some level of comfort until they're able to to settle into their new home. So in a nutshell, that is essentially the state of where we are right now. We have been able to fully vaccinate all 63,000 people in this past week. Um, and, and we are waiting. Uh, and if you know anything about the MMR vaccination, we would have, we have a, about a 21 day waiting period to ensure that it fully takes effect before we're able to have our guests uh, resettled. So our goal right now is to start the resettlement process, make sure that folks get out to their co communities, get jobs, get settled, and start their new lives. And our goal right now is to get them housing, jobs, and resettlement. Inshallah, it seems that it is quite the undertaking. <laughs> it really is. It really is. I mean, you know, these uh, uh, safe havens, the military basins, uh, we're not meant to house this many people at once. As you can imagine, there are uh, men, women, children, elderly. Um, you know, we have the medically fragile. We have pregnant women. Um, and, you know, we're having uh, daily, we have births on, you know, at the local hospitals in many of these areas. So it is quite an undertaking. And 
but one thing that's made it really uh, work is the is, is the support of organizations like yours and others across the country that have stepped up to give donations, provide uh, uh, winter winter friendly clothing, and and so that partnership is essential to making this work. Well, thank you for giving us an update on the families and where they are currently. Um, I know Ikhna Relief and many others are anxious um, and excited to welcome them to their new homes in the various states throughout the country. Alhamdulillah. So, inshallah, we'd like to bring you back at the end of the program for a question and answer period, if you could stay. Of course, for sure, inshallah. Jazakallah. Yeah. So, it is my pleasure now to introduce Brother Sahil Galani who is with Catholic Charities in Dallas, Texas, and they are one of the resettlement agencies when families leave the military bases and come to the various states, the resettlement agencies will welcome them and bring them to their new home. So he's going to talk to you a little bit about what they've been doing um, and what they're preparing to do, inshallah. Welcome, Brother Sahil. Thank you so much. Um, so after they leave the uh, military bases, they are welcomed to um, the cities in which they will resettle in and rebuild their lives with support from organizations, uh, refugee resettlement organizations and other community partners such as ICNA Relief. Um, and so especially here in Dallas, uh, we're, we're really blessed to have ICNA and Sister Hala uh, I can give you the, the example of yesterday, for example, uh, we had an emergency arrival of a family of seven um, and um, Ikna Relief was able to get um, a um, fresh, um, hot, ready to eat meal for the family. Uh, and so what we do on the local level is um, we provide all the resettlement services, uh, including case management. We get the families a, uh, a home. Um, we furnish the home. Uh, and again, this is done through um, a collective team effort. Um, so out of donations from the community, as well as relying on community partners um, and so on and so forth. So furnishing the home with um, your basic furniture, um, household items, uh, food, and um, just making sure uh, there's a really homey vibe. Um, and then we pick up the family from the airport. Uh, we bring them back to their new home. We give them uh, a safety orientation. Um, and then we continue on with the case management services uh, there are different populations uh, who we serve, um, and depending on the populations, um, the services are tailored to them, uh, including um, personal identification ap applications, uh, applications for social security cards or work permits, um, and then enrollment in uh, cash or rental assistance programs um, until they can be self-sufficient. Uh, and so after we help them apply for, let's say, their socials and their work permits, uh, we help them get jobs um, and uh, really uh, enroll the kiddos into school and really get the family uh, integrated into their new communities. Um, so that those are uh, kind of the the services in in a nutshell uh, that that we provide. Uh, the current needs are um, always monetary donations are, are always helpful. Uh, and these uh, are used uh, in providing food, furniture, household items, uh, rent, utilities, uh, as refugees come with a very finite um, limited budget. And so we are tasked to stretch those budgets as much as possible and it's always um, good to um, have community support in, in terms of that. Uh, other um, other in-kind donations that uh, Catholic Charities relies on from community partners uh, to resettle uh, refugees and, and other populations include 
uh, furniture, household items, personal hygiene items, uh, a lot of which uh, we rely on ICNA for. So um, Sister Hala and I ICNA have been uh, very generous uh, to our new arrivals. Um, and yeah, those are, those are the services that, that we provide in a nutshell. MashaAllah, thank you so much, Sahil, for this um, information. This is really uh, important for the community to know how the process um, is going on here and what do we need uh, from the community to keep supporting uh, the refugees. We always have like lots of questions and uh, why other organizations like Asian Relief and uh, other like uh, mosques or church, they have to help these refugees since they're coming through the government, the government has to provide everything. But as you like mentioned here with the uh, small amount of uh, money they're getting from the government, which is not even enough for, you know, like two months, three months, depends on the situation of the family, um, that, that uh, we need the, the community to support um, the families. Yeah, community support is, is always um, critical. Uh, and so it, it depends on the family size, uh, honestly. So larger families, the, the budgets, the way they work out is they're per capita. And so larger families tend to be okay. Uh, but if, if the smaller the family, the lower the budget, and we just have to stretch it further. So it's just great to have community support to uh, provide um adequate and exceptional services to our newly arrived uh, refugee families. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sahil, uh, for um, this information. If you can stay with us until the end, we have the question and answer uh, from the community. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sahil. Um, so now we have our uh, next uh, uh, guest speaker, uh, Brother Fred. And uh, Brother Fred is uh, from a Refugee and Immigrant Assistance Center, uh, the Refugee Resettlement um, uh, Program. So, Brother Fred uh, Buga. Hey, Brother Fred. We can't hear you. Sorry, I was muted. That's okay, Brother Fred. Um, thank you for joining us. Can you just give us also same um, introduction about the work that you're doing? Thank you very much. My name is Mbuga Fred. I'm from Refugee and Immigrant Assistance Center. Uh, we have three offices, one in Boston, another one in Worcester, and another one in Lynn. Uh, what we do, Refugee and Immigrant Assistance Center was uh, established in 1993 as a Somali Women and Children's Association, uh, predominantly Muslim and African, but later on trans transitioned into a resettlement agency in 2003. And uh, its mission is to promote cultural education and social economic development among refugees and immigrant uh, communities. Uh, at REAC, we offer a range of services uh, that support successful resettlement and uh, self-sufficiency of immigrants. Our programs include uh, refugee resettlement, which covers reception and placement and case management. We have post-resettlement services, which include helping clients uh, uh, apply for green card, um, helping them to pursue or continue their career. Uh, we, we also have citizen citizenship program, uh, which help clients to apply for citizenship without charging them. And uh, that one does not uh, does not uh, care whether you came as a refugee or uh, you came in any other situation. As long as you are eligible to apply for citizenship, uh, you can come to REAC and we will be able to, to serve you. Types of immigrants we serve include refugees as defined by the UN and uh, uh, US uh, immigration laws. We also serve SIVs. These have been specifically from uh, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. Uh, we serve Chuban and Haitian entrants. That is a program in the USIS. 
we serve asirees those who have been granted asylum already and currently we serve the humanitarian parolees who have been uh, who have uh, just arrived in the country from afghanistan and i want to mention that uh, RIAC was the first agency in Massachusetts to receive uh, Afghanistan from, uh, from uh, sorry, to receive families from uh, the Afghanistan families who are now being resettled in the US. We received so far two families and one of them is still hosted in a hotel as we are planning to look for apartment. I will come to that because housing in Boston is one of the challenges we we are facing. The settlement program uh, begins, uh, all I can say is the identification and selection of vulnerable refugees for relocation to a third country for purposes of ensuring protection and secure future. The resettlement begins with refugees, uh, begins when refugees are still abroad. Uh, United States Refugee Admission Program working with stakeholders like uh, United Nations High Commission for Refugees, uh, the Bureau of Operation Refugees and Migration, which is part of the Department of State, are the one that fund the overseas reception and uh, placement programs. United States, uh, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, uh, USCIS, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security, and the Office of, Re, uh, Office of the Refugee Resettlement, ORR, which is part of the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, provide several programs for refugees within and outside uh, the country. Uh, worldwide, there are, I'm just giving you how the refugees come, come here or how they come to be refugees and we receive them. Worldwide, we have, uh, five international NGOs operating the settlement support centers around the world and uh, the supervision of uh, uh, supervision and funding of PRM. We used to have nine national domestic non-government organizations, uh, but they were reduced to six now uh, in the country, which are contracted by PRM to, 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 to receive and uh, uh take care of refugees those nine agencies now they are six uh, they have affiliates 350 affiliates in the us and in massachusetts uh we were three agencies each of them affiliated to one of those six now and uh, riac is one of them affiliated to ecdc in the state each state has a state refugee coordinator and a state refugee health coordinator. The size of refugees to be admitted and the composition uh, of refugees for admission program is finalized through consultation with Congress and finalized by the president. It is the president that announces the admission seating. Um, the fiscal year 2021, uh, the president announced an emergency determination on May 3rd, 2021, that the admission ceiling would be 62,500 refugees. The fiscal year ended uh, September 30th. So we started a new year. However, they announced that we will be having extension for those refugees up to December. So uh, any refugee is going to come in uh, will be considered uh, in the previous year. All refugees admitted uh, must have go or they undergo security check by FBI and uh, CIA before they come to United States. United States Citizenship and Immigration Services is the one that determine their status. PRM, as I mentioned, contracts with voluntary organizations, uh, the six one I mentioned, and uh, to administer the program of reception and placement. Each of those six has a network 
as I mentioned, uh, all over the country. Affiliates like LIAC will provide initial reception and core services to refugees, which include housing, clothing, food, assistance with medical referrals, employment services, registering children to school, and the other social services. At IRIAC, we provide intensive case management to refugees from the day of arrival at the airport up to 90 days. That is intensive case management. Then we continue with the basic uh, case management uh, to families up to 12 months. Those are two programs, at least the first 90 days are very intensive and uh, they could be challenging, especially if the refugee doesn't have any US tie here. And uh, if they have, sometimes it's a little bit easier. One of the challenges we have is housing, because in Boston, houses are very expensive. And uh, compared to per capita, given to every individual refugee is too small, which make which makes it hard for the refugees to get better services, especially when it comes to housing in Boston. So REAC mostly relies on donations, both in cash and in kind from well-wishers. For citizenship program, uh, uh, we, we do help anyone who's eligible to apply for citizenship uh, regardless whether you came as a refugee or in any other form, as long as you are eligible to apply, you can come to 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 REAC. We will be able to help you without charging you any fee. So in a brief, because of time, that is what we do at the Refugee and Immigrant Assistance Center. We have been resettling since 2003. I've been with REAC since 2015. So every year the numbers have been going up, uh, but starting 2016, the number declined and due to pandemic last year, we couldn't even get all the numbers we had projected to resettle. So that is why they have even put the extension that that fiscal year, the settlement program or refugees that were expected to come will continue to come in the same year up to December. So thank you very much. That is what we have, and that is what we do. Yes, um, thank you so much, um, Fred, for the information. That's really, really amazing to hear about all the work that you're doing. That's really great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So, Sister Malika, we have now our Brother Isha. Yes, um, I'm just hoping that uh, Brother Fred can stay with us. So we're starting to get some questions in the chat. So I'm hoping he'll be able to stay with us and our other guests so we can have our questions and answers. Um, in the end, we do hope to get to everybody's questions. So please keep them coming, um, inshallah. But now we have a very special, we have two very special guests. Um, they're actually employees of ICNA Relief. We have Brother Isak Alpar, who will be speaking from New York. He is our hunger prevention lead um, in New York and helps process our request for financial assistance for our clients. Brother Isak came to the United States in 1999 as a refugee from Afghanistan. Yes, and we have our amazing um, Brother Abdullah Zakaria. He's our Southern uh, California area manager. He's also uh, a licensed emergency uh, medical professional. Uh, Abdullah came to the United States as a refugee from Afghanistan in the 1980. So we have our amazing Ashaf and Abdullah here with us to tell us about their journey. So we're hoping to learn from you and you can share a little bit about your experience coming to America as a refugee and as a young person, what it must have been like. So uh, basically, I mean, I think uh, what we want to really kind of stress out here is that the refugees that will be coming in here are not very uh, different than many of the immigrant families that might be listening in right now. 
um, and some of the struggles that you might have, they might have went through, uh, we went through, and and definitely the the brothers and sisters coming uh, pretty soon will be coming through. My story really in the in the in the late seventies, uh, communism had uh, you know basically um, illegally illegally came to the country, and um, as a result, my family, uh, being Mama Zai family, uh, we were you know the the tip the the typical um, uh, families uh, that were in power in, in the previous regime and um, you know we were forced out you know we were either imprisoned uh, or uh, you know executed or you know had our properties taken away and so there wasn't really a choice my father coming here or not and so um, he only had two days of notice uh, you know that he had to leave or uh, there could be repercussions uh, and so it was a it was a no brainer. He he had to leave and find ways. Alhamdulillah, we had family here already uh, at the time, and it, it made things a little bit easier. But brothers and sisters, I just want you to take a step back. Uh, just like many of you guys, many of the immigrants that came here, my parents came from uh, learning daddy. My father spoke French. He spoke German. Unfortunately, he did not speak English. So when he came here. Uh, it was completely different. Uh, he was already in his 40s. Um, and uh, my mother, the same way, uh, educated background, but not in English, in the, in the English language. And so when they came here, um, it was uh, it was very difficult for them. Um, the lifestyle, uh, you know, the language, the education, um, all these different things were, were, were not in their favor. You know, and uh, but alhamdulillah, with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they made it through, but they made it, they didn't make it through without working hard. Uh, I remember as a kid, my mom uh, working 16 hour shifts in the nighttime, you know, from working graveyard shifts, my, my father working, you know, 12, 13 hours during the daytime to make sure that the ends were, were, were meeting. And, um, and some of these families will be going through that as well. You know, and uh, as I mentioned, you know, so, uh, we had some family that would help a little bit uh, with, you know, support, moral support, uh, you know, these type of things. Um, uh, but the bulk of the work was was on the, on the parents. And I remember as a child, uh, you know, we, when we were given food stamps, what we used to do is we used to we used to have a card. And when we go when we go to, uh, you know, get lunch at school, they would take a, a hole puncher you know, on the day and they'll put the hole puncher whenever you go to, um, you know, you get your breakfast or you get your lunch. And uh, being in one of those lines, you know, where everybody else in front of you, they might be getting uh, the, the normal lunch. You would come in there and they would say like, are, are you in the free lunch? Yeah, I'm in the free lunch. And and then you see other people, they get extra juices, extra, extra stuff. And we were like, well, can we get some of that? And they were like, no, no, that's, you know, you have to pay for, for the extra stuff, you know? And I can imagine my dad just talk, talking to me in my head whenever I would ask that question out, you know, just him coming in my head saying, no, you're not, <laughs> we, don't have, we don't have any room for that, you know? We don't have any budget for that right now, you know? But right now we laugh about it, you know, because it is what it is. And, uh, but, it, you know, at the time it, it was different, you know, we were different. And, um, uh, and we had to go to the ESL classes. We had to go to extra classes that maybe some of the other kids didn't have. And in my time in the eighties, there wasn't like, you know, families and families of Afghanis in, in America. There wasn't, there was only a few, they, they knew each other. They could be living 10 miles away and they knew each other's names, which is very kind of funny too, uh, because random people would know each other, but uh, they would say, oh, you know, Mahmoud from, you know, 10 miles away, you know, and, you know, Hassan from another 10 miles away. Uh, and that's the way it was, you know, it was, it was kind of fun, uh, you know, because my parents get to meet the different people from different parts of Afghanistan, but that they normally would not meet. But uh, at that time, these families, uh, you know, the good thing about the families that are coming here, inshallah, that they, they will be able to grow uh, with one another. You know, and and going through the same struggles. A lot of these schools might be having uh, droves of families there. They're coming uh, from overseas, and so there's there's a lot of positives in that. Inshallah, ta'ala. for our community, uh, it's important that we're able to 
uh, not allow them to go to the same struggles, you know, uh, that, that we went through. You know, we have to provide, you know, education. We have to provide uh, a lot of the things that, you know, a lot of uh, the immigrants uh, in other countries, they may have, you know. Uh, these are, you know, spontaneous. These, a lot of these people, 133,000 families that might be coming in, uh, they need uh, an orientation not of one day or a few hours. They need a full program just to get them to understand what they've got themselves into as far as, you know, uh, what's their responsibilities in this country, uh, their rights in this country, their, uh, the, the disadvantages of, of being here as well with regards to their faith, with regards to their spirituality. At times, it can be difficult. And so if we're not able to provide uh, that uh, spiritual uplifting uh, as well, you know, and guidance, there might be, uh, we might have, uh, repercussions down the road. And so it's important that the Muslim community really looks at one another uh, as brothers and sisters and tries to uplift and help, uh, inshallah ta'ala, uh, these refugees and not to, uh, you know, have them go through some of the things that we might have gone through, the negative things, you know. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and again, just remember you were in this same space, maybe 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, maybe some of the youth are not, didn't go through this, but your parents went through it. And so, uh, these families, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, they understand and they, they have the support that we, that we can possibly give them, whether it's a vacuum cleaner, whether it's a, a towel, or different things. And so, uh, it's important that we come up with the entire program, uh, as a Muslim Muslim community, inshallah ta'ala, uh, so that we can uh, move forward and really be a source of uh, having this being an addition to the community uh, in the in the years to come forward, inshallah ta'ala. I guess it's my turn to uh, let the audience know of what uh, my uh, journey has been as a refugee in America. I did come in uh, 1999, September, in America. Uh, I was 16 year old, year old back then, and with my mom, two of my sister, and my dad. Uh, for unfortunately, my parents were not um, uh, literate of the English language, and our life was extremely hard when we came over here. Um, going through the documentation, we could not work for a couple of months. And when we came here, um, the funding that we received wasn't enough. Uh, we had to go ahead and um, start from scratch. We came here with a couple of briefcases of clothes uh, that we had, and we left everything behind. We had nothing uh, in our pockets, no money, nothing. But Alhamdulillah, with the grace of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, things uh, slowly started uh, going. Uh, towards our favor. It's a land of opportunity, alhamdulillah. We took the advantage of that. Uh, my sisters could not start school because, uh, high school, because of the age factor we had. Though in back home, such such thing doesn't exist, those rules that uh, even you're 20 year old or something, you can still go to school. But our here, they had to go to GED. They had to finish GED. From GED, they have to go to college. But I was fortunate enough to go to school. I had a lot of challenges when I went to school. Language was an issue. Uh, beside that, I was not accustomed uh, to, to the whole environment of how the school works over here. Uh, just a small incident, gazing at somebody's eyes like that, it was uh, looked as an insult and that would bring some kind of brawl. So I, I, it, it was a tough year, the first one. Uh, I didn't even know where the cafeteria was. It was so bad that, uh, I used to take food from home. I didn't even know there was cafeteria because back home we never had cafeteria in school. So we used to, I used to eat down the hall and one day I got caught by the dean. They were like, oh, you can't do this. And then they found out that I'm a refugee, I'm a new kid. And then uh, they, they, I slowly picked up. So it, those challenges have been very tough, but Alhamdulillah, they have been a good experience for us. This uh, where I am right now is because of my parents and the hard work they have done, as well as my sisters and me. Um, my sisters uh, started working um, uh, at the age of 19, 20, because we need to come uh, uh, come up with some kind of earning to pay our rent, to start 
uh, buying food, uh, food stamp had not kicked in when we were in here because of uh, documentation that needed to be completed. So there was a lot of steps and a lot of hard work that we that we had to go through in order for us to be on our feet. Uh, my parents did not speak English. Um, they 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 couldn't work. The only work they could have got was work at somebody's home, take care of their kids and stuff like that. Um, there was another there was another good thing about coming to New York was that it, it's a very diverse uh, city. So Alhamdulillah, with, with that, um, my dad, uh, me and my dad were going to the mosque. And while going through that, we found out that um, there's Ikna over there. And we didn't know what Ikna was. And my dad started working uh, as a cleaner over there. And then Alhamdulillah, as he picked up, then I got over there. I I get to know what Ikna was. I volunteered Ikna. But there was a lot of Muslims brothers that uh, from Ikna that we received a lot of assistance uh they helped us, us in, in a lot of different ways uh i can't imagine um, the things they have done for us and i'm thankful for each and every brother uh when we were we had some tough times they were there for us uh, life is hard uh, you leave everything back home you come back to the united states um thinking that um oh it's a country of opportunity it is but things are not as yet as easy as it seems um, I still have a couple of family members uh, back in Afghanistan who call us that, oh, could you help us here and there? They always have this thing in the back of their mind that the, the money is hanging out on the tree and then we need to support them. So, but they don't understand the challenges that we go through. Um, it was not easy the first two years that we went through. Uh, I've said this numerous times and I'll say it again, but uh, we were depressed. Uh, we had no friends. Uh, we left everything back home and alhamdulillah slowly slowly uh, the brothers as we knew them uh, the family got bigger alhamdulillah I got married with kids uh, things just started happening for us uh, it is true that uh, when you have a good intention and you try to do the right thing allah will definitely help you in the, in in your path and alhamdulillah has done uh, my sister and um, uh, one of my sisters is a manager in a bank. The other one is an admin in a private school. I'm, alhamdulillah, working in one of the greatest the Muslim organizations, Ikhna Relief, having a big role as New York Hunger Prevention Lead. Uh, what can I ask for? I'm thankful for Allah for everything that he's done for me. Uh, I guess uh, it was meant to be for us to be in America. And with my role, um, I'm so grateful that one of the best i say one of the best projects for me that i'm in charge of hunger prevention from this i can help a lot of people and i have seen a lot of uh, refugees that come to our food pantries that we help so it's it has been a, a whole uh, circle of life you get from one hand you get it from the other so what comes around goes around uh, but then the time when i was in need my brothers and sisters helped me and now i have this opportunity and i thank a lot that I am in the um, giving end and not a receiving end. And with that, I'm, I'm definitely uh, going to help as much as I can with these, with the brothers that I have in here. And inshallah, I'll, I'll do my utmost what we can do. And maybe inshallah, Ikhna Relief will definitely also try their best what they can do for uh, these refugee families. Um, there's a lot of resources available in every corner of uh, United States, we just have to tap through those resources and definitely we need to guide our brothers and sisters who are in in this uh, platform right now and just give them a, just, just a little push uh, to proceed with their life and then get on their feet and inshallah ta'ala one day they'll be just like us sitting in such a better position and telling everybody, look, I was a refugee and look where I am and look what I have become. So Alhamdulillah, I thank Ikhna Relief and I thank Allah for everything that has done has he has done for me and where I am. And I also thank my parents for being patient with us. Uh, there's no words that I can describe. Alhamdulillah, all this was possible with the help of the brotherhood we had, the love of our parents, and the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And uh, I thank everybody. Alhamdulillah for everything that has happened to me. Inshallah ta'ala, we are here. We are here to take any questions if you guys have. But brother, 
uh, sit tight, have sabr, inshallah, ta'ala, and you will definitely proceed in life, inshallah. Let me ask you a question, this yeah. Now, now, when you were when you were a ref- when you when you came, what, how old were you? Sixteen. So about sixteen years old. Did you have any problems with dealing with toys or or certain shows that you wanted to watch or anything like that? Oh See, yeah, for, yeah. I, I I came here when I was like four years old, right? Uh-huh. So I had to borrow toys from like my my friends, right? So you know, but in that time there used to be Transformers. I was a big Transformers guy, right? You know, Decepticons and and, and, and everything. <laughs> and I and every time I wanted a toy, I couldn't get it, right? So so I go to my a friend of mine and say, "Hey, listen, uh, hey Billy, you know, uh, uh, you know, I know you got the new Decepticons, you know, toys and you Transformers, you know, they used to transform and everything like that." I said, "You know, can I borrow it?" He's like, "No, I just got it. I can't let you borrow it, but let me." You know, so we'd have to wait for two months for him to get, you know, sick of the toy. And then he'd come and bring the toy and he'd watch and play with it. You know what I mean? And, I, I, and of course, I'm the second child, so my older brother would take it first, right? So I'd finished, he had to finish on uh, playing with it. And then I had to go play with it, you know. By the time wow. I finished, Billy was Billy's mom was knocking on the door already. <laughs> Give me back my toy, you know. So we used to do this all the time. And, 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 um, uh, you know, it, it, it happened all the time, right? So every new toy, the video games that would come up, you know, we tell Billy, "Hey, man, bring your bring your Nintendo up to our, our apartment or whatever." You know, and he'd bring and we play over there. You know, and it, it happened for years. You know, until and you know, we got teenager years, then we started, uh, you know, trying to you know work. Like I used to, I used to take garbage, right? I used to go to the. Um, my, my neighbors and I say, hey, listen, I take your, um, I put your garbage in your dumpster, you know, just, you know what I mean? Just give me, you know, twenty bucks or something like that. Or I, you know, in Virginia, where where I grew up, uh, I'd clean the the pavement for the for, of the snow. So I used to just do that. So my dad was like, hey, where's Abdullah? You know, and it's just, my mom was like, oh, he he left. It was like early in the morning, and I was like fourteen years old uh, when it was in school, of course. Um, and I just go and clean the and, and clean the things, uh, you know, the sidewalks, and come like around seven o'clock, and they're like, "Oh, Bacha Kujosti," you know, like where, are, where are you? <laughs> I'm like, where are you? You know, where, what are you doing? I said, "Oh no, just you know, you know." I wouldn't even tell them that I'm making money, you know, to, off of it. I was, I'm just helping out his neighbors and this and that, you know. So he he didn't want us to feel like you know because we didn't have that thing, you know, that I had to do that this kind of work, you know. So, but uh, no, it was. It it's, it's fun times we had, you know, and I, I don't know how Alhamdulillah. We what had little. Things? Yeah, we had little, but uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, it was enough for us at back in the days. Alhamdulillah. I remember that um, I, I, I'm a big cricket fan. So when I came, I was in a team in Pakistan. And when I came here for the first year, I could not play cricket and I was dying. So how I, I got my first kit for cricket was. I was distributing newspaper in the morning and even in freezing cold, I used to distribute sometimes my hand would frozen, but I would just think of that moment that I'll, I'll have my own bat and play. That moment just kept me going, going, and I saved enough to buy a cricket bat. And Alhamdulillah, now I'm, I, 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 I buy enough that I support other team members who don't have. So we are there definitely. But... Where do you play cricket, man, in New York City, man? It's like concrete. Uh, New York City, we have we, there's so many leagues over here. You play cricket, Alhamdulillah. It's, it's, awesome, awesome. We are in it, Alhamdulillah. But, yeah. Cool, cool. You know, uh, we I think we can just go on with so many stories back and forth. You know, but uh, I, I think have, I think have, uh, have, uh, uh, somebody is requesting that we speak in Pashto, but we can speak in Farsi. We are we are fluent in Farsi, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So maybe we can talk, brother. So actually, Mark got me said, but but Daddy got me said, "Come like he, come on, pa 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 mother, pa dad, ma, come on, she would then, you know, pa pa she just born, but then as well, and as kind of hard, but then, they got boss back up, like she, pa she, he, ma, they back up, but when the boss attack, Daddy got me said, "All the children, ma, man, as as bad as that, like, we get two tables, pa she just born, pa she just born, ma, but they are messy, pa she just born, that they got us, they got all the names, but all the time, do pa she just got me said." Alhamdulillah, for 
مگم از فور ترکی همی فارسی که گپ زده میکرد یکی دیگه هم فارسی ریاض گرفته اون خب نه با خدا تو اردو هم گپ میزنی اردو هم یاد میگیرم ان شاء الله اساس اساس کل یک چند زبان دیگه یاد میگیریم ان شاء الله ان شاء الله بیاد ان شاء الله بخیر خود خوش دیدی بتونه دات آی گو دیر یو گو وی گات سم دادی وی گات سم یو نو دیفرنت لینگویجز وی گات سم استوریز I'm sure our sister Malika probably has a bunch of questions. Inshallah, I know we have a lot of questions coming through here uh, as well, Inshallah. So uh, we'll, we'll give the floor a little bit to them, Inshallah, as well. Inshallah. <laughs> brother Abdullah and brother Ishaq, that was amazing um, stories, like really inspiring and um, touching. Jazakumullah khair for all these stories. And yeah, we have a uh, few questions. So yeah, inshallah, if you can stay with us and we'll um, go to that part. So Sister Malika. Oh, yeah, I come. Uh, it was so cool hearing them speak in their native language. Um, I am so <laughs> terrible with languages. I'm still trying to learn Arabic and really don't speak English that well either. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was such an inspiration hearing them talk. Um, yeah. We're just really proud to have them on Ipna Relief staff. Um, we can learn so much from them, especially now. Um, so, Sister Hala, there have been a lot of questions in the chat. Um, we're hoping to get to some of them um, at the end, but I think in you're going to be able to answer some of those questions in your presentation now, talking about um, specifically what ICNA Relief offers um, through our refugee uh, services. Yes, yes, Sister Malika. Alhamdulillah, um, as, as you know, and um, you know, but maybe not many people know that ICNA Relief Refugee Services Program started decades ago with the arrival of the first Bosnian um, to the United States. And since then, it can relieve um, helping and serving refugees from all around the world. We've, uh, serving, um, we've been serving refugees from Iraq, Syria, um, Congo. We have people from Sudan. Um, we have the Afghan, of course, and um, Congolese. We have people from all around the world. We're serving people. Um, from different different places uh to talk about like the the program that i can really provide nationwide uh, to the refugees uh alhamdulillah we've been um serving refugees with so many things um starting the uh in-kind donation furniture supplies hygiene supplies cleaning supplies food um hot meals uh, financial assistance, case management, uh, car donation, uh, educational program, so many uh, programs that we are like providing for the uh, for the refugees, alhamdulillah, nationwide. Um, what make the program of Ethnic Relief uh, special, that alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, that we're working closely with a resettlement agency. Nationwide, we've been like partnering with um, about 13, 14 um, resettlement agency like Catholic Charities, IRC, RST. Uh, we have uh, the uh, Refugee One, um, different agency. Um, the purpose of Economy working closely to the agency, uh, we do not want to like duplicate any effort, waste any resource resources from um, the community. That's why we work closely with the agency, try to see how we can supplement, how we can fill in the gap. Uh, with what uh, the agency that providing. So um, as we know, and uh, now uh, we can also ask our like guest speaker about the specific amount of money that the refugee receiving from the government. As far as I know, from our uh, past uh, meeting with uh, Sahil and uh, Catholic Charity and uh, other agency, they informed us that the amount now is $1,025 per person, uh, one time only, and this money they uh, they have to use it for everything from um, the, to purchase the supplies, the furniture, paying the rent, purchasing the food. So when ICNA Relief is uh, coming to sponsor and help the, the refugees with the program that we have, we're trying to save this welcome money so they can, the agency, they, they can use it for the rent to, to give more time uh, for the refugees to be on, um, on their feet. You know, so uh, we sponsor the family, we provide the furniture needed, supplies, as I said, and everything. 
and immediately we we'll work with uh, with, uh, with with the agency. We also provide the uh, ESL program. We provide computer classes, uh, sewing classes for the lady, empowerment classes, tutoring for the kids, mentorship, mentorship for the family, mentorship for the uh, youth, um, as well to uh, to support. In addition to financial uh, assistance. Uh, again, what make uh, Aikner Relief Program special is, alhamdulillah, the support of the other amazing programs that we have in Aikner Relief. As you mentioned, Aikner Relief, we have over 46 food pantry nationwide. So the food pantries that providing halal meat, uh, cultural, like, you know, uh, uh, food for the people coming from different different countries. Uh, so the, the food pantries, it's, it's very supporting the refugee services program. We have uh, our amazing back to school program. Back to school program, it's not just uh, providing school bags and supplies. Back to school program, providing uh, educational workshop for the parents, for the kids, for the teacher, providing grants for the teacher also to support their classroom. So uh, the, uh, the, the program that, uh, the other program that uh, it can really providing to support the uh, refugee services program, it's making it very special. We have the medical clinic, uh, our free medical medical clinic. As you mentioned, Sister Malika, we have eight clinic nationwide. We have our mobile clinic. Uh, we also provide a lot of workshops for the uh, refugees. Uh, we provide uh, counseling, 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 counseling. You know, um, and again, we can hear more from our uh, guests about why important to provide counseling for uh, the, the, the family that are coming from these, um, the situation, the war, the uh, trauma that they, they faced uh, before they arrived. So the counseling services, this is a crucial program. I mean, it's only in the 2020 session, Malika, we provide over 6,000 sessions um, uh, for, from, the, for, for, from our counseling um, offices, counseling clinics. Uh, I mean, which about like about seven hundred thousand dollar in um, dollar value for for the for the counseling. Um, so, alhamdulillah, I mean, as 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 I'm saying, the uh, the program that it can relief uh, providing and, and, and supporting um, the refugee program is making it very uh, very special, very very uh, good program. Alhamdulillah, um, we have amazing support from the community, supporting us with all these in-kind donation, uh, brand new supplies, furniture, uh, cars, um, uh, volunteering with us. Um, I know there's a couple of questions about like job placement and case management. So yes, uh, I can really provide in case management. So in addition to the resettlement agency providing to to support their family, the basic thing with applying for the paperwork and this type of thing, it can relief come and help uh, with case management. We do uh, have a case management program in uh, different offices um, nationwide, uh, connecting the uh, refugees with other other like uh, agencies with other like services uh, in the community. Where we do have a job placement. Um, program to connect also the refugees with uh, jobs. We have training uh, program also training the refugees. Um, for example, in the coming um, October 15, October 22, we do have a uh, 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 resume building um, workshop to help the refugees build their resumes and also to do like mock interviews, just like, you know, to to, to uh, help them to get uh, ready for the actual uh, interview from um, the, when they go apply for jobs. And um, in addition to that, as I said, like we have the car donation program, that very important program. Like for example, in Dallas, public transportation is really, really hard. Um, and the car is very important. So providing cars for the refugees and before providing the car, helping them with driving lessons and, um, and uh, the driver license and, 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 and then give them the car and purchasing the insurance for them. This is something very uh, important part of uh, the refugee life to, you know, to make it faster for them to, to stand on, on their feet. 
So Alhamdulillah, our program is like, you know, holistic program, um, starting with a refugee before they arrive by sponsoring them through the agency. We get the uh, key from, for like empty apartments and we put everything from doormat to the food in the fridge. Next day we come with the agency to welcome the family and introduce them to the program that we have. Um, and we, can, we keep up with them. I have, um, we keep up with them. It's not like just like, you know, two, three weeks working with this family and leave. we stay with them like for years uh, until they are on their own. And I have family, we, I start with them like five, six years ago. And now they are like, they just uh, received their citizenship. Um, I have uh, several like uh, kids um, came here um, years ago and now they started like medical school. Um, they're so with us. They're like helping us. They're volunteering with us. They're providing uh, uh, support to the other families. Um, so that's what makes a community program uh, special. It's not just like, you know, police in Cambodia and we stay with the family until they are, they are, they are on their own. And with, uh, with the support of the, the community, amazing community, um, making it like really um, easy um, and uh, successful program, let's say, uh, with, the, with the support of the community and working closely with the amazing resettlement agency that we have uh, nationwide. Um, I mean, that's what uh, I have, Sister Malita. I don't know if you have a, a special question or anything from the uh, chat that you want me to answer. Hopefully, I give, I answer everything already, <laughs> but just in case. I can't hear you, Sister Malita. I'm not sure if. I was on mute. I'm sorry. <laughs> you good. <laughs> As I was saying, I, I'm always so amazed when someone donates a car to a family. I mean, mashallah, may Allah reward them tremendously. It, it's just amazing how families come together. And as you spoke, working with families for so many years, myself have worked with various refugee populations coming for, for ages. And, you know, I've gone to Somali weddings. I've gone to, you know, Bosnian weddings. Um, you know, I met Afghan families many years ago and I love bro Brother Islam laugh. I love um, Ashok. It's one of my favorite dishes, which is an <laughs> Afghan dish. You know, it's, it's, these families become family. It's not yeah. just that we're working with a client. You know, they become family who we stay with for years. And as you said, they come back and volunteer, which is the most yeah. special part of it. You know, and I think that's what really, truly makes it can relief different. I think it's because we are working fi sabi Allah. You know, yeah. we're working for the sake of Allah, God. And, you know, we truly look at the people we're serving as human beings, as our brothers and sisters in humanity, no matter from where they come from. So yes. it, it's just, it's a wonderful experience. And it's such a blessing to be a part of these families' lives. Yeah, Sister Malika, as I said, like, for example, like since the, um, with, with the influx of the refugees uh, coming now with the crisis that's happening now, the first, uh, I mean, the first thing that I I um I face from the from the former refugees that they're like calling me and texting me, hey hello, we wanna help, we wanna like can can like some ladies, can we cook uh, hot meals for this new arrival? The other one, can I come and, and help with the setup for the for the apartment? Is there any need to uh go and help them? Like even there's like you know the language barrier between the two um uh, um families like um you know like afghan or syrian or, or, or like you know somali or other but like they still want to do anything they can anything they can to uh to support and help there's an old saying those who know know yeah so yeah. um we'd like to bring all of our speakers back um and take some questions from those that are viewing from home um, so we can get a little bit more information and really get to the meat of things and what people are curious about. Yes. Can we bring everyone back? Hope we didn't catch anyone off guard. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, 
Brother we do have much. someone who is asking for you to say something again in Pashtu. I guess they really enjoyed that. <laughs> um, but I wanted to, you know, we had a few questions that they've been scrolling, but I wanted to know, especially for those that are working in resettlement, what is the difference um, in resettlement today as, as opposed to, let's say, 10 years ago? Anyone feel free? Or were none of you working 10 years ago for a resettlement? I think Sahil has, Sahil, yeah, you have a long uh, experience with different different agencies, Sahil, right? Like before coming to Catholic Church with IRC, I guess. So how yeah. do you feel? Um, so I don't have 10 years of experience, but in regard to uh, resettlement, I think um, the agencies do similar work um, and the core services have uh, stayed pretty consistent uh, throughout the years, I would say. Um, the populations change, however, and um, so uh, as you guys can see now, we have the um, Afghan crisis or um, prior to that, we had the Syrian crisis. Um, and so um, different situations arise, which leads to different populations. Um, but I think uh, service-wise, uh, that has to be pretty consistent in the last five years or so. Um, but maybe Fred has been here longer in terms of 10 years or so. Yeah, thank you very much. As I mentioned, that I also started this, or oh, I joined the settlement programs in 2015. So that is six years back. But still, as you mentioned, that uh, uh, the core services have been consistent, are still the same. Uh, there has been a little bit increase in per capita, as you saw at first, we used to give them. Right. They used to get 1,150, uh, uh, no, uh, 25, then it went to 75. I saw someone talking about uh, uh, per capita being 1,225. Yes, but that one is particularly for the Afghan, those who are coming now. The real refugees, uh, the normal refugees, still getting 1,175. Uh, so that is the difference. Wow. I mean, I know in Boston, Massachusetts, where I am from, a three bedroom apartment could run you close to $3,000 per month. You need almost $900 to move in. So that per capita is not going to cover the cost of resettling a family here in Massachusetts and probably in most major cities. Yeah. Can you yeah, it depends on the family size, uh, but that's why there are um, additional support services and programs that kick in after the initial uh, reception and placement program. So then you have the match grant program or the um, refugee cash assistance programs uh, that can provide a little bit more of a um financial support for the families uh rental utility and cash assistance wise until they are uh indeed self-sufficient well, this is for everybody as a hill or it depends on, on the funding from the government is it like on on, on a regular basis for everybody or it's it's um yeah so that's a great question so up until actually uh thursday uh the afghan um so there are different populations that, that we resettle, right? As Fred mentioned, there's refugees, there's those who have uh, different ORR eligible populations. So you have the refugees, you have those who have been granted asylum, you have Cuban Haitian entrants uh, or Cuban Haitian parolees. Um, I will say uh, parolees is not in the negative context that uh, people are I kind of accustomed to. Um, in terms of um, our correctional systems, is it's an immigration um, kind of um, uh, status, immigration status uh, that certain groups are given, uh, and then they can apply for asylum to get long-term um, 
immigration status. And so up until recently, the Afghan uh, Pearl population uh, were not going to be an ORR eligible population, but this just changed on Thursday. So all of the national offices have kind of um, been telling the local offices such as ours that, hey, they are OR eligible now, which is amazing uh, because they will get access to those uh, services and resources that other refugees and other populations will get. Uh, and it'll, it will really make a huge impact. They'll have access to a lot of our uh, support services like employment services, education, ESL classes, uh, additional case management programs, rental utility assistance programs. Um, so yes, if you had asked me that on Wednesday, it would have been a different answer, but uh, things are pretty fluid and, and fluctuating. Um, so it, it's it's great that our, um, at, that the congressional leadership was able to get that legislation passed and it's it's awesome for the families. So that means that the families will be eligible for some of the- advocacy. The, the work of the advocacy works uh, well advocating on behalf of, of those people to get these benefits. Um, as I heard from Sarah um, the week before, they were like working a lot and trying to advocate on behalf of uh, these population to get these benefits. So it worked well then. To yes, pass these, yes. Uh, yeah. It was all due to uh, political advocacy and um, our congressional leaders and um, a, a really collective effort on uh, the policy uh, and legislation change. Great, great. Yes, Shmolita, sorry. No, I wanted to, um, I was going to ask a question. So this means that now the Afghans, regardless of their status, will be eligible for federal benefits like SNAP and um, TAFDC and things like that? Yes, yes. So, so they'll be, be eligible for uh, SNAP uh, or food, better, uh, also known as food stamps, uh, Medicaid, um, pregnancy Medicaid or um, refugee medical uh, assistance insurance, uh, the private insurance in, in states, in certain states and so on and so forth. Yes. That's wonderful. It's a great and that will apply. Yeah. And that's, um, and what about the legal status? Sahil? Are they going to give them a legal status or not yet? Uh, so they're, they're being, so there's, Afghans are coming with various different uh, immigration statuses. Uh, so there are special immigrant visa holders. So these are uh, those that helped the U.S. Army uh, in the Afghan war, either as interpreters working with the U.S. Army in, in some way, shape or form. And therefore, uh, their and their families' lives are, were in danger. Um, and they get the same uh, benefits as refugees and are OR eligible. And they have uh, permanent legal status uh, uh, upon arrival, and they get their green cards very soon thereafter. There's another group of um, individuals called SQSIs, and these are uh, individuals who, um, again, help the U.S. Army, work for the U.S. Army, uh, but just due to everything escalating so quickly in the uh, U.S. Embassy in Kabul closing so quickly, they might have just not completed their SIV um, immigration status fully, but they were far enough enough long uh, along in the process to where they can complete the processes here in the the bases, and so then um, they get the same uh, immigration status eventually uh, here, like post arrival, and they'll get their green cards and so on and so forth. The third group of Afghans that we see are um, Afghan parolees. These are paroled into the country, and this is a, a, a mixed group of, of individuals. Uh, so they're, um, they can be people who are persecuted due to the same five categories that a refugee would, race, religion, nationality, belonging to a certain uh, social group or having a certain political opinion. Uh, it can be SIVs who are just way too far from the finished uh, process, and therefore they're being paroled in. These individuals are those who will have a two-year um, window, if you will, uh, where they have paroled status, but it is going to be our responsibility 
Catholic Charities and other resettlement agencies to help them apply for asylum. And then uh, USCIS will adjudicate uh, those cases and, and um, depending on those, they will be granted as a, a, a asylum or um, what have you. And so that would uh, allow them to have that long-term permanent legal status then. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. I mean, that's that amazing to know. Thank you so much, Sahil. Well, any more questions, Sister uh, Malika? Yes. I mean, it's been a lot of talk um, this afternoon about Afghans, but um, can you say a little bit more about um, where you're seeing people coming from as refugees? Because I know it's not just Afghanistan, and I want people to understand that you know we still have an obligation to help all of those that are coming to the U.S. seeking safety. I won't monopolize the conversation. So I, I'm sure Fred has the same knowledge as I, I do. So Fred, if, if you wanted to talk about the other uh, populations, and I'm sure we serve similar yeah, populations. Yeah. yeah, we do We do serve the same because all the nine agents, the six agencies now I mentioned are the one that receive the, uh, the, the, the refugees and then distribute them to their affiliates. So, uh, there has been some changes uh, and uh, is sometimes every year because there is a year where we had that uh, the number of refugees coming in were from Somalia. Then we changed uh, to the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, then let alone to Syria. And uh, uh, currently now we have Afghanistan. But all along we've been having uh, refugees from uh, Congo, from Syria, from uh, uh, from uh, Somalia, those have been the major producing refugee countries. But even other countries like uh, uh, like uh, uh, El Salvador, uh, Guatemala, and uh, Colombia, we've been getting refugees from those countries. And uh, uh, every year we've been some demographic demographic changes, but mostly those countries. Uh, in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, we've been having uh, SIVs, and uh, the, the number because for their for them the numbers has been always determined every year. They usually been getting like five thousand per year uh, who are supposed to come in. So we've been getting SIVs every year from uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. So those are the countries that we've been serving mostly. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to open it up to our audience. If there are any more questions, um, please feel free to put it in the chat. So um, with the Afghans that are coming, I know with um, many uh, refugee populations um, going, going back some, that they are required to sign a travel loan and um, must pay that travel loan back um, before they're able to apply for citizenship. Can you talk a little bit about that? And will that be the same with the Afghans? Uh, no more refugees who have been coming in, they usually come with that promissory note, which requires them to pay for the air ticket. But for the Afghanistan, the two families have uh, received, I didn't see anything like that. So uh, we are waiting whether IOM will communicate to us in a form but for them so far i didn't see any document like a promissory note that they are supposed to pay that's As correct so um afghans who are coming from the uh bases are not having the iom loans um and so um but normal refugees uh who come from uh overseas they do have the um iom loans and um Contrary to popular belief, it, it's actually a good thing uh, for uh, the families. And uh, there isn't a thing that uh, they're, they're stopped from citizenship or applying for citizenship until they repay the, their, their loans. Uh, the purpose of these loans are, are at least twofold. One is uh, to allow, them, uh, allow for uh, more future families to come in. And then the, the circuit... The second purpose is um, for uh, the families to build credit history in, in America. And so they're not initially going to have any credit history, right? Uh, and, uh, and so 
it really allows them to to build and, and boost their credit history. Um, and there's no interest rates or, or, or things like that. Um, so it's just the cost of the airfare tickets uh, and the Afghans who are coming from the bases. Uh, there is a special program set up for those families. Oh, and then the uh, the organizations also have like payment plans and programs uh, and they're not required to repay them until six months after like the start date to repay is six months after, which is normally enough time for us to get them self-sufficient anyway. Um, and then even then, if there are certain situations, there are payment plans or they can defer their payments to a little later when their financial circumstances improve. Um, so it's, it's not um, as negative as, as a loan might seem. Um, it's actually a good thing. That's amazing, Samuel. This is the first time I, I mean, I know about like, this is like building credit or something. That's really, I mean, that's, that's, that's cool. It's nice yeah, to know. I've never heard it explained that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. yeah, me neither. Mm -hmm. So, so Brother, so uh, Brother Harris, Sister Malika, I'm not sure Brother Harris is still with us. Brother Harris, um, are you still with us? Can you hear us? No, um, he, he had to leave, um, unfortunately. We, I mean, we have like a question about like what equity relief provided to the people in the uh, army bases. Uh, and I forgot to mention that before. Uh, yes, equity relief um, sent, uh, sent already and uh, working on sending more uh, donation to the army bases to the people there we sent like a uh, few truck um trucks um full of like you know supplies clothing um food hygiene supplies quran prayer rugs uh back to school school bags because we don't know how we're not sure i was i wanted to ask further harris about uh, to give us more information about that 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 the time period that they're expecting people to stay there uh, but um, we send the back to school school bags and the, these things and people they really appreciated um, the supplies, uh, especially the back to school one, in addition to all um, donations. Um, and we're working on more trucks to to go there. I believe we've been able to send trucks to both bases in Texas and in the Virginia area. Yeah, yes, yes, we did. We did in both. And now, now we're working on. Um, we have a meeting coming next this coming week, working on um, the winter uh, drive there, like jackets, uh, blankets, uh, winter clothing, these type of things. So we're working on with several agencies um, to send trucks and uh, supplies for, for them there. That's going to be crucial up here in the Northeast. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I wanted to say, you know, ask like, Icon Relief is doing a lot of work. The resettlement agencies are doing a lot of work. How can the community help um, resettle those that are coming to America? What is, and what do you feel that they can, and this is both for, um, you know, Brother Fred or Brother Sahil, you know, what do you feel the community's role could be or should be? Okay, uh, for IAC, we of course we've been working with the communities uh, right from the time I started. First of all, uh, as I said, looking for housing is hard. So sometimes we would go to the, we would make a call to the community, those who can host for the time being as a look for apartment. Uh, what others do, they do prepare for us, we call them welcome baskets. Uh, this is a basket that contain basic essential things that a family may need it may include um, soap uh, toothpaste uh, uh, cooking pan plates anything small that a family that has just set in need and then we organize those ones every family comes we give it that one so other 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 families or community what they do they give us uh, they give us um, uh, gift cards that after putting the family in a house, then we give them a, a gift card, they will go to the store and buy what they need. 
We have some big community or associations like uh, our uh, Muslim Society Association. For them, they help us always with the rent. For example, we put the family in a house, we pay first and last, and then the second month comes, they don't have money. So we write to them, we send an application, and then they help us pay for at least a month or two as we help the family to get the job. So that is our appeal to uh, for the community to continue doing that, and those who have not been doing so to uh, come to us and do it. But that is how we interact with the community, and that is what we get from them. I would also say uh, volunteering is is a big need for us as well. Uh, so those who might be in the Dallas area, if you're interested in volunteering, uh, you can email volunteer at ccdallas.org. And we have several voluntary, uh, uh, voluntary positions and opportunities. Uh, these include um, apartment setups. And so this is where we will task volunteers to go to either our donations or Walmart to uh, get household items and uh, food for the family, take it back to the apartment and uh, fully set it up, make the beds, put the food out, put all the pots and pans, dishes where they're supposed to be and make the apartment a home. Um, there's also uh, airport pickup opportunities um, where uh, you take a family um, and welcome them and uh, greet them. Uh, so there's that and then a huge need for us right now um, is uh, volunteer interpreters. Uh, so uh, we have, I think somebody mentioned uh, cultural orientation uh, is, is a huge component of uh, adjusting to a, a new lifestyle here in America. So we have cultural orientation classes. And in these classes, we need uh, volunteer interpreters, Dari and Pashto, uh, being the, the languages. And, and if you ask me, um, that's where the existing Afghan community uh, can really play a pivotal role. Uh, a lot of people can uh, donate, a lot of people can volunteer for apartment setups and, and things like that. But language wise, uh, that that is uh, a, a key asset that the Afghan uh, population that's already resettled here has uh, that we, we really need for the newly arriving families. Um, and then monetary donations are always, always important. Uh, and so if, if you wanted to donate to ICNA or Catholic Church Dallas, I'm sure you can visit either of our, our websites. Um, so ccdallas.org, for example. And uh, so that we can supplement the uh, assistance amounts that we have and pay greater amounts of rent, utilities, purchasing food, furniture, household items, personal hygiene things, um, I think. Oh, and then mentorship. Uh, mentorship is, is also important. Like um, uh, Ishak and, and Abdullah said, it's, it's, it's very important for um, newly arriving families to have a social um, support system uh, and so uh, families uh, really showing um, new arrivals little basic things that we might take for granted like how to check your mail or how to grocery shop and know how much change you should be getting back for the groceries you just you just bought uh, or how to pay your rent how to use public transportation since you're not going to initially have a car um, there are things that like like that uh, that can really go a long way. Yes, and if you're not in Dallas, so, so if you're not in Dallas, you could always go to ichnarelief.org, and you can contact um, Sister Hala or myself or our national headquarters and find out how you can volunteer in your community in Shawla. So um, go ahead, yeah, friend. Okay. Right. I have a small thing that uh, I wanted to mention. The need we are going to have, uh, especially uh, on the uh, on the Afghan who are coming now, is that we are going to need people, especially lawyers or law students, to help us file their applications. Uh, we 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 expect a big number, and it would have been far better 
for the application is to be filed as early as possible. Uh, so we will have a need for such people so that they can help us. Uh, in Iraq, we've been uh, trying to, um, the only person handling uh, resettlement, uh, we are going to hire someone. Uh, I'm also a law student from Massachusetts School of Law, but given that I have other things to do, I will not be able also to help on application. So we will have a need for that. Yes, that's something that ICNA Relief is working on nationally uh, throughout all of our um, field offices, especially where uh, refugees will be placed, is working to get those that um, speak the native language. Um, I learned something today from my colleagues um, that, you know, Pashto and Dari are not one and the same, and they do not speak Pashto. <laughs> they only speak Dari. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I guess that's, you know, a learning process for all of us, um, which is part of why I like this work. You know, I feel like I have traveled around the world without even having to leave America. So it's just wonderful to be able to meet all these newcomers to the U.S. Yes, um, so Malika, one more thing also, um, I don't know if, if our like community know about like our faith program, the Foster Parenting Advocacy and Education, and that working with the um, kids that they, I think, um, I, uh, Sahil, I don't know if you can um, tell us a little bit about the kids that are coming without their parents here that they're looking for family, foster parenting. Do you have any idea about the, um, how many people do we have already? Um, what's the process to have these kids um, be in, in a foster home, how it can relief can provide services for um, for those kids? Um, unfortunately, I don't have too much information on that. Uh, so that's handled in uh, a separate department for Catholic Charities. Uh, so it's the Unaccompanied Children's and Unaccompanied Refugee Minor Program. Uh, mm -hmm. That's under a different director. Uh, but I would assume um, that well, I, I, I don't want to actually misspeak, so um, maybe I, I, I shouldn't assume. <laughs> yeah, from, from, my un, from my understanding, before any unaccompanied minor would be placed in a home, that that family would have to go through a MAP training or foster care training, which would include a criminal background check, a home study, inspection, um, quite a few steps before they're able to become a licensed foster care provider. But I think, you know, the government and, you know, working with these unaccompanied minors have an obligation to keep them safe. So they would be looking yeah. to licensed foster care homes. I mean, inshallah, by um, our next webinar, we'll be focusing on um, on the foster parenting and, uh, and the kids and how people can help um, with, with, with these uh, program, the FAPE program and uh, the foster painting. So we'll provide more information about it for the people that they're asking um, in, in um, our next webinar. That's going to be a very important webinar. I've had a lot of families reach out to me since this new um, Afghan crisis asking, can I adopt a child? Can I have one of those children? And, you know, they think it's, you know, just as easy as picking up the phone, but the FAITH yeah. program of ICNA Relief is such a wonderful new endeavor that ICNA Relief has taken on to try to work with families. There's such a need for Muslim foster care providers in the United States, you know, not just for unaccompanied minors or refugee children. A lot of our families are facing, you know, their children being taken into the system. Yeah. And where do those children go? So I, I really hope those, you know, who are interested really join us for our next webinar. I'm sorry, I don't have the date. Maybe Sister Hala does. Um, uh, October 13th. October 13th. That would be great. And of course, you know, you can go to our website and learn more about the FATE program. Um, and, you know, really encourage you to take that next step. If you're really serious about wanting to have a child and to support and help a child, take that next step, become a licensed foster care provider. Um, so when an opportunity does arise, you would be first on the list, inshallah. Yeah, 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 I agree with you, so, Malika. Brother Adola, what does it feel like to work for ICNA Relief now, coming to this country as a refugee and now working with those that are coming? How does that feel? 
Well, I mean, it works. Uh, it feels great because, um, you know, I, I, my refugee status was uh, came in the early 80s. So I grew up in this country uh, four years old, you know, went through all school here, uh, college, my brother, uh, uh, you know, uh, as well, sisters as well, were born here. Uh, so it's a little bit different. But now, uh, you know, uh, when I contribute here, um, I speak from, you know, the uh, 40 years of being in the United States, right? So uh, you get the feel of growing up, being basically in the low income and poor families, um, <clears throat> you know, um, and uh, going through the experience of how, you know, how my parents went through, what my parents went through, what I went through, you know what I mean? And uh, not only from being a refugee, but also being a Muslim. Uh, you know, in, in the 80s, even the masjids were not as frequent as uh, our, you know, in, in, um, a close vicinity as they are right now. So uh, there's the, that history portion of it. Uh, and then there is that side of uh, working for an organization that wants to uh, help uh, refugees and also people who are from low income communities irrespective of their background, irrespective of the language they speak or the religion that they follow. Um, and so I try to bring that um, expertise on the professional side, uh, as well as, um, you know, get, uh, be able to be able to understand where uh, these new immigrants are coming from, how they were, and, you know, what are some of the things uh, that they're going through, the struggles, uh, the positives, the negatives, everything that, that goes with that. So uh, we try to bring that experience over to the organization uh, to be in addition to the wonderful uh, staff members that are, are, are still are there with us. Uh, over 100 staff members that, that work with the Clean Relief uh, from different uh, various backgrounds also help us to contribute uh, and get different viewpoints uh, and different understandings as well and that we kind of help each other as we endeavor in uh, domestic relief uh, work here in the United States. So we're going to get ready to wrap up the program, inshallah. I have one last question for Brother Isak, and then um, if anyone has any closing statements. But Brother Isak, you came in 1999 as a 16-year-old. What would you have liked then, or what would have helped you then that you didn't have? I, I wish uh, I had the experience that I have right now. And with that, I would have been able to do a lot more for the community, and I would have an idea how to tackle my challenges that I had back then. But was I'll there have... anything that someone could have done, an agency or a program like Ikhtar Relief, could have done to make your adjustment easier? Well, yeah. I mean, we were kind of lost, uh, even though we were going back and forth. Translation was an issue back then as well. But Alhamdulillah, now there are a lot of agencies. I think Ikhna Relief also have certain uh, different kind of ethnical uh, uh, workers over here that can help in that as well. Uh, providing resources, case workers. I mean, getting through uh, uh, the process of Medicaid, food stamp, and all that. Um, th that would definitely give us a heads up if, if we have a resource center that can help us in that area. Actually. So Alhamdulillah, we're, we're, Ikhna Relief is right on track. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So, um, Brother Sahil, do you have any closing remarks? Okay, sorry, the chat kept opening up. Um, <laughs> I would say uh, housing seems to be a concern for all of us. So if there's any viewers in Dallas um, that are apartment complex owners or if you guys know of any in your networks who would be willing to rent to our clients, uh, I think it's a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, so if you have uh, in your personal networks uh, or if ICNA knows of any uh, landlords, um, apartment complexes who, who would be willing to rent to our clients, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is s. G I L A N I at ccdallas.org. So if anyone knows of uh, any apartment owners or um, can connect me, that would be amazing. Thank you. 
we do outreach and, and things like that uh, all the time, but just throwing that plug out there. Thank you. And I know Brother Abdullah wanted to answer the same question as Brother Isak. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to add, answer. Here in California, we're getting about 3,000 families or so already. Um, and so some of the messages that I probably will give to them is to be uh, really the orientation side of it, really to understand, as Brother Sahil, Sahil uh, mentioned, uh, you know, how to work. Uh, in this society where there's transportations, where is uh, getting a job, where there's getting education. Um, the, the, a lot of these folks are going to need that. Also, I think they need to know as well as a different thoughts and ideas that they're going to be bombarded with here as well. Uh, living in this society is different than living in, in a society that many of these uh, folks came from. And I think Hector Willi can come and bond, make sure that there is a bonding and understanding uh, not only of translation of language and, and, and the writings, but also the translation of uh, the values and ethics of these countries well, in, in comparison to different values and ethics that might be uh, held in other countries. So, you know, they need to be able to have that adjustment period and, and hopefully uh, with the trainings, with the different courses, with the refugee support group, that I know that uh, our office here in the Relief is going to be opening up. Uh, we need to be able to provide this uh, uh, environment or have an atmosphere where we can have a discussion, a talk, and uh, and I think also uh, this is a long term. This is a long term project. Uh, it's not. Uh, we definitely want people to donate. Uh, you know, different items and support the people with as microwaves or vacuum cleaners or these things. But we also want them to donate their time and effort and expertise as well uh, to come in and, and to be a teacher and to be a, a role model, to be uh, a support group for a lot of these families in Shalatala. Uh, so just, I just wanted to mention that as well. Wonderful. So, I know that there's a lot more questions. People are really interested in learning more. Please visit ICNRelief.org. Um, if you know that families are coming to your area, again, ICNRelief has 35 offices throughout the United States. Um, families will be coming to a town near you very soon. Um, we're expecting within the next few weeks, correct, Brother Sahil? that families will be released from the military bases and sent into communities? Oh, uh, we've already been receiving them, so yeah. they're here now. Mm -hmm. No, I understand, but I believe that they're going to be releasing a lot more and they're going to be coming a much, much larger influx into some of the cities. So if you are yes, aware yes, of families... Correct. Mm -hmm. So if you're aware of families coming to your community and you want to volunteer and then you're in one of it can release 35 states, please reach out, reach out. We can help plug you into volunteering, working with families and really providing the resources that these families need. Yeah, and um, also Sister Malika, um, as you heard from uh, uh, Brother Sahil about the, um, the need of the financial assistant and you know, it can relief, uh, we do have a financial assistant program and we have our director, Brother Ishaq here, financial <laughs> department. And he knows how much we're asking him to send us like these check and checks. So if people can sponsor a family, if they can send um, monetary donation um, to support a family with their uh, rent, utility, grocery, um, cleaning supplies, as you know, even if they're like, um, they start working, their income is very low income and uh, cleaning supplies, it's not cheap and they still need to need us to provide with these uh, cleaning supplies and um, other um, necessities and um, help with, with the rent. So if uh, people can help with that, they can go to ICNA Relief, www.icnarelief.org slash donate and um, under refugee services, donate um, to sponsor any family or any program. And diapers. Diapers, yes. Definitely yes, yes. diapers, which could not be purchased with food stamps, with SNAP benefits. Yes. So there will be a lot of needs. And I heard there were quite a few babies that are being, being born on our basis. So, you know, welcome to America. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're right. And um, we we didn't mention that we have our specialty pantries in Ignorly that providing cleaning supplies and diapers. Um, so this is also um, a 
special program it can only provide in um, offices. So it's basically anything that you would need for your own home. These families are going to need for their own. And we yeah. also ask, you know, when you donate, donate something that you yourself would like to receive. You know, we try to, to the best of our ability to preserve the dignity of the families that we serve. You know, so always, you know, brand new items, you know, something that you would like to receive, you know, really goes a long way in welcoming these families and showing them that they belong. Yes. So I think that is about, um, I think that's about it for, you know, this, we're going into this evening, this afternoon. I really appreciate all of our guests. A special thanks to our Afghan um, staff with Ikna Relief. Um, we'll be calling you often. <laughs> um, and once again, thank you to Brother Sahil with Catholic Charities in Dallas, to Brother Fred with REAC in Boston, Massachusetts, and um, Brother Harris is kind of all over the place working with <laughs> the Department of Homeland Security, but all of our guests were wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sahil. Really appreciate your work, the amazing work that you're doing in, in Dallas and nationwide in all the offices of Catholic Charity. Um, thank you for Abdullah and Ishaq, our dear brothers, and Sister Malika. Yes. Okay. See you next time. So with we'll our welcome, everyone. Webinar. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.